Yes, guys, so let's solve some illustrations out here. Look at the first one. Scenario A, following is a structure of a group headed by company X. Company X is a listed entity in India and prepares consolidated financial statements as per the requirements of India's. Company A is an unlisted entity and it is not in the process of listing any of its instruments in public market. Company X does not object to company A not preparing its financial statements. Whether company A is required to prepare the consolidated financial statements as per India's one debt. Guys, company X is basically holding the shares of company A and company A probably also has another subsidy. So company A becomes an intermediary parent enterprise. In an intermediary parent enterprise, if the shares are not listed in any public market or in the process of listing, and what are the conditions? It is not listed nor in the process of listing. Ultimate parent enterprise is already presenting the financial statements on consolidated basis. Then you can claim exemption from consolidation. Clear? So in scenario A, yes, uh, the company A has satisfied all the conditions. Therefore, it, it is exempted from consolidation. Look at scenario B then. Assuming the same facts as per scenario A, except that, Company X is a foreign entity and is listed in stock exchange in a foreign country and it prepares its financial statements as per generally accepted financial state, uh, uh, generally accepted accounting principles applicable to the country. So whether your answer would be different. Guys, in the same situation, if I look at, if you look at uh, scenario B, consolidated financial statements of company A are not prepared as per India's, hence company A cannot avail the exemption. Why? Because the holding company is not an Indian enterprise, it's a foreign entity. It is not preparing consolidated financial statements as per India's. If it is preparing as per India's, then only interim parent company is exempt. Here, interim parent company is not exempt since the ultimate parent company is not preparing financial statements on a consolidated basis as per India's. It is preparing as per whatever gaps in that particular country is concerned. Look at scenario C. Assuming the same facts as per scenario A, except that A, uh, A is 100% investment, 100% of the investment in A is held by Mr. X instead of company X. Will your answer change? Guys, individual is not covered under India's. So Mr. X is an individual who is controlling 100% shares of investment in A. So therefore, since Mr. X is not preparing financial statements on consolidated basis, the exemption is not available to company A. Look at the answer of scenario C. Mr. X, Mr. X would not be preparing financial statements as per India's. Therefore, company A cannot avail the exemption from preparing a consolidated financial statements. Look at the question now. Company A has 100% shares in company B, 60% shares in company C. While company C in turn holds 100% shares in another company X. Look at what is the question. Company A is a listed enterprise and prepares consolidated financial statements as per the requirements of India's. Company C, which is a subsidiary of company A, is an unlisted entity and it is not in the process of any listing. 60% of share capital of company C is held by company A. Correct. Balance 40% is held by outsiders. Company A does not object to company C for not preparing consolidated financial statements. Ultimate parent company is preparing financial statements on consolidated basis as per India's. Interim parent company, which is company C, is it required to prepare financial statements as per India's? So whether company C is required to prepare, company C is eligible to claim the exemption provided all its shareholders have agreed. So company A is only holding 60% in company C. So there is 40% held by someone else as well. So those minority shareholders should also approve that the company C is not necessary to prepare financial statements on consolidated basis. Only then company C is eligible to claim exemption. But in this case, company C is eligible to claim exemption if the balance 40% also agree that company C does not prepare financial statements on consolidated basis. Assume in scenario B, assuming the same facts as scenario A, except that 
the balance 40% of equity shares of company C is held by company B itself. Guys, C balance 40% shares are if they are held by company B, then who is the minority shareholder? Company B itself. Company B is a 100% holding company or subsidiary of company A. Therefore, if company A agrees that company C need not prepare for consolidated financial statements, then that is sufficient for company C to claim an exemption from consolidation. Scenario A and scenario B. So company C is not required. They can avail the exemption from consolidation. Look at the next question. A and B have formed a new entity AB Limited for construction and selling of residential units consisting of 100 units. Construction will be done by A and it will take necess necessary decisions relating to the construction activity. Company B Limited will do the marketing and selling related activities of these units and it will take all necessary decisions relating to marketing and selling. Based on above, who has the power over AB Limited? Is it company A which has power over AB Limited or is it company B which has power over AB Limited? Guys, we cannot decide because A is performing the function of construction, B is performing the function of sale. So you don't know which is more significant than the other. If you believe that A Limited's construction activity is more significant, then A Limited will have a power over the investee AB Limited. But if you say B Limited, which is doing the marketing and selling is more significant in activity, then B Limited will have a power over AB Limited. So with the given facts of the case, either A could be a, 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 having a control or B could be considered to having a control. Who has the power in this case? Both AB Limited have a right to unilaterally direct different related activities of AB. Here, investors shall determine which actor, uh, which activity will most significantly affect the returns of the investee. The investor having an ability to direct those activities would be considered to have a power. So, which one will actually influence the returns? Is it the construction which will influence the returns? Or is it marketing and selling those units going to influence the returns? At we don't know. That is the reason why. Look at what is the conclusion. Hence, if the investor concludes that construction is more significant, effect, uh, which will affect their returns of AB Limited, then A Limited is said to have a power over AB. On the other hand, if it is concluded that marketing and selling activities would more significantly affect the returns, then B Limited is said to have a power over AB Limited. So there is no conclusive answer in this case. It depends upon what is your contention. Who has a power over the investing to influence the returns of AB Limited? If A Limited's construction is more significant and is expected to affect the returns of AB Limited more, then A Limited has a power over AB Limited. If B Limited selling activities are more influencing, are more significantly influencing the returns of AB Limited, then B is said to have a power over AB Limited. So I am giving both the answers guys. A is an asset manager of a venture capital fund. A is an asset manager of a venture capital fund. So what is A doing? Out of the total outstanding units of the fund, 10% of the units are held by A Limited himself. Balance 90% are held by other investors. Majority of the unit holders of the fund have a right to appoint the committee which will manage the day-to-day -day administrative activities. Guys, it's a venture fund. What is the main business activity of a venture fund? To invest and derive returns. Here, the committee which is being appointed by the majority unit holders is only for administration activities. However, the decisions relating to investment, disinvestment are done by fund X is taken by the fund manager A Limited. Based on the above, who has the fund power over fund X? Guys, in this case, A Limited can direct the activities or has a power to influence the return of the fund that is X. Therefore, it is A Limited which has a power over the fund X. A Limited is able to direct the activities that can more significantly affect the returns of fund X. Hence, A Limited has a power over the investee. However, this does not mean that a Limited can control the fund and the consideration will be given to 
other elements of control evaluation as well. That is exposure of variable returns and link between power and exposure of variable returns. So it's just adding a few more sentences out there. But ultimately the derivation is A limited has a control over fund X. An investment vehicle, the investee is created and financed with debt instruments held by the investor, a debt in investor. And the equity instruments are held by number of other investors. So basically one company is based buying the debt instruments of another company. Equity instruments are held by various people. The equity tranche is designed to absorb the first loss and to receive any residual return from the investee. Guys, that means they are exposed to variable returns who equity invested. One of the equity investor holds 30% of the equity is also the asset manager. The investee uses its proceeds to purchase the portfolio of financial assets, exposing the investees to credit risk associated with the possible default of principal and interest of assets. The transaction is marketed to the debt investor as an investment with minimum exposure to credit risk associated with possible default of assets because of the nature of assets and because of the equity trance is designed to absorb the first losses of the investee. The return of the investee are significantly affected by the management of the investee's asset portfolio, which includes decisions about selection, acquisition, disposal of assets within the portfolio, guidelines of the management upon the default. All those activities are managed by the asset manager until defaults reach a specific portion of portfolio value. That is when the value of the portfolio in such of the equity tranche of the investee is consumed. For, the, for that time, the third party trustee manages the, the trust according to the instruction of the debt investor based on the above who has the power over the investee. So basically there is a debt instrument, there is equity instrument. Out of this equity instrument, 30% is held by one fellow who is basically saying that equity is the one which will take all the hit. Debt will not be taking any hit. So the fund manager, whoever is appointed, he will take care of disinvestment or investment policies until it reaches a specific proportion. After it reaches that specific proportion, they will be removed, the fund manager will be removed and the third party trustee will be managing the fund at the instruction of the debt investor. Then in such case, who has the power? Look at the answer. The managing the investee, investee's asset portfolio is relevant activity of the invest because that is the one which influences the return from the investee. The asset manager has an ability to direct the activities until defaulted assets reach specific proportion of portfolio value. The debt investor has an ability to direct the relevant activities when the value of the defaulted asset surpasses a specific proportion. If the default surpasses a specific proportion, then only debt manager will, or uh, the debt investor will come into picture. The asset manager and debt investor each needs to determine whether they are in able to direct the activities that are more significantly affecting the investor returns and including consideration, purpose and design of the investee as well as each party's exposure to variability of return. Guys, though the answer is not conclusive here, I will put it like this. As the debt investor, I am not subjected to variable returns until, until the equity proportion of entire losses are gone and then the debt value also will reduce. But that is a significant proportion. Until then in a normal course of action, debt investor will not derive any variable returns. He is only entitled to receive fixed rate of interest. Therefore, in such case, I have a tendency to believe that the asset manager has a power over the investee. The powers of the asset manager will diminish or will completely go out only if he incurs a loss and such loss is to a certain proportion of the portfolio value. Until then, it is the asset manager who is having the power over the investee. So if you want me to give it an assertive answer, then asset manager is having a power over the investee only if the asset manager has incurred a loss and that loss has exceeded the proportion, then only the debt investor has a power over the investing. Clear? Following is the voting power of B Limited. 
10% is held by A Limited, 90% held by 9 other investors holding 10% each. All the investors have entered into a management agreement whereby they grant the decision making powers which are related to B Limited to A Limited for a period of 5 years. So A Limited has a power to basically administer B Limited for 5 years. He got this power from all the other investors put together. After 2 years of the agreement, the investors holding 90% of the voting right have some disputes with A Limited. So they wanted to take back the decision making right from A Limited. So they wanted to withdraw the power of A Limited over B Limited after 2 years. This can be done only by passing a resolution with majority of investors voting in favor of removal of A Limited rights. However, as per the termination clause of the management agreement, B Limited will have to pay a huge penalty to A Limited for terminating the agreement before its stated term. Whether the rights held by the investors holding 90% of voting rights are substantive. So, do they have substantive substitution right? Can they substitute A Limited substantively? Guys, you need to understand, though they can substitute, they have to incur huge amount to be paid to A Limited. Scenario B. Scen what, this is scenario A. What is scenario B? Assuming the same facts, except that there is no penalty which is required to pay be paid by B Limited on termination of the agreement before its stated term. However, instead of all the investors, only four investors totaling to 40% of voting power have had disputes with A and want to take back the decision from A Limited. What is whether the rights of investing 40% are substantive? Look at scenario A. If the investor holding 90% of voting power exercise their right to terminate the agreement, it would result in B Limited incurring huge penalty which would affect the returns of B Limited. This is a barrier which would prevent the investor from exercising their rights. Therefore, the rights to substitute A Limited are not substantive. Look at scenario B. I can do it without paying a penalty, but only four investors having 40% have come together. To take back the decision making from A Limited, investors holding majority of voting power need to vote in favor of removal of A. However, the investors are dispute and do not have a majority because they are only holding 40% of voting power. Therefore, these rights are also not substantive. In both cases, who has a power over the investee? In both the cases, the power over the investee is held by A Limited, who just has 10% of voting power. Who gave him that power? All the other shareholders put together, they vested him with that power. Question number 6. An investor is holding 30% of voting power in ABC Limited. The investor has granted an option to purchase 30% more voting power from other investors. However, the excess of option is too high compared to the current market price of ABC Limited. Because ABC Limited is incurring losses in the last two years and it is expected to incur loss in the future period as well. Whether the rights held by the investor are substantive to purchase the balance 30%. Assuming the fact of the same scenario A, except that the option price is in line with current market price, ABC is making profit. However, the option can be exercised in next one month only and the investor is not in a position to arrange the funds within one month time. Whether the rights to purchase the options or to purchase the further 30% are substantive. First case, they are not substantive. First case, why is it not substantive? Sir, I can buy 30% more. No, I automatically get the voting power. I have a right. It is a potential voting right that I can acquire. Yes, but understand that the price at which you can exercise the 30%, extra 30% is much high compared to the current market price. Sir, high also no problem, sir. I'll still buy. That is where he said. ABC is incurring losses for the last two years. Expected to continue to loss in the future period as well. Therefore, it is very rare situation where the investor wants to acquire additional 30% by paying a higher amount when you know that the company is going to incur loss in future. Therefore, under scenario A, the investor's right to purchase the additional 30% is not substantive. What about second one? You can buy. It is the purchase price is exactly in line with current market price. I am expecting that the company will make profits in future. 
If I would have put a full stop, you will say, yes, sir, rights are substantive because it is very certain that the investor will acquire the other 30% as well. But he added a condition. The options can be exercised in one month only and the investor is not in a position to arrange the required money in one month's time. Therefore, even though the right is substantive, but for investor, it is not substantive because he has to arrange the funds within one month and is in no position to do that. Therefore, the rights here are not substantive. Look at scenario C. Assuming the same fact of scenario A, except that ABC is making profit. However, the current market price is not known since ABC is relatively a new company. The business of the company is unique and no other company does similar business in the market. Hence, the investor is not sure whether to exercise the purchasing option. Whether the rights held are substantive or not. What did we discuss in scenario A? It is not substantive because it is too high compared to the current market price. In scenario B, the right to exercise is not substantive since the period to the investor is, is not sufficient, it is too narrow. C, also not substantive. Why? Because there is no information regarding the current market price. A, the investor also doesn't know whether he wants to buy or he doesn't want to buy. So therefore, this is because the investor is not able to obtain information about the market value of ABC Limited, which is necessary to order to compare the options exercise price and to decide whether the exercise of purchase would be beneficial or not. In this case also, it is not substantive. So all three scenarios. Number one, excise price is much more than current market price and the company is expected to make loss. Not substantive, not beneficial. Number two, current market price is equal to excise price. You are expected to make profit, but you have to excise within one month. Within month one, one month, it is not practical for me to acquire. Not substantive. Third one, you can have a right to acquire another 30%. The company is expected to make profit, but there is, I cannot identify reliably what is the current market price. In such situation, you cannot determine whether it is beneficial to the investor or not. Therefore, the right to purchase further equity is not substantive. All three are not substantive. A venture capital fund is managed by an asset manager who has a right to in make an investment or disinvestment decision related to the corpus fund. The asset manager is holding certain stake. The asset manager is holding certain some stake in the fund. The other investors of the fund have a right to remove the asset manager. However, in the present situation, in the absence of other managers who will be willing and able to provide specialized services that the current asset manager is providing and the purchase of stake from the current manager is, uh, is holding the fund whether the removal rights are substantive or not. Guys, here the removal rights are not substantive. Why is the removal right not substantive? Because you need to understand, though they have a right to remove him, there is no realistic option for us, but to actually have the same person. Therefore, you cannot consider it as a substantive right. If other investors exercise the removal right, then it will impact the operations of the fund and ultimately the returns from the fund since there is no substitute of the current asset manager who can manage the corpus of the fund. Hence, removal rights are not substantive. ABC is a manufacturer of branded garments and is the owner of Brand X. PQR has entered into a franchisee agreement with ABC Limited to allow PQR to set up a retail outlet to sell the products of Brand X. As per the agreement, PQR will set up a retail outlet with its own funds and decide the capital structure of the entity, hire employees, their remuneration, select vendors, etc. However, ABC will give certain operating guidelines like interiors of retail outlet, uniform to the employees, other guidance to protect the brand name. Are the rights held by ABC Limited substantive or protective? Guys, these are protective rights. These are not substantive rights because it is PQR limited who can basically hire employees, who can sh sh uh, schedule their re remuneration, select the vendors. So everything is given to PQR only. So ABC's rights are only protective in nature because they are only talking about what is the interior, what uniform they'll wear. You have to come in at so-and-so time, you have to get out at so-and-so time. These are guidelines. These are only protective guidelines. They are not substantive guidelines. 
if abc limited has a right to hire or fire the employee has a right to upload uh, sorry uh, onboard or offload a particular supplier then you can say that they have substantive rights here such rights are still vested with pqr limited therefore abc limited's rights are only protective in nature you cannot call that abc has a power over pqr The activities that most significantly uh, affect the returns of PQR are funding, capital requirement, hiring of the employees, vendors, etc., which are exercised by PQR. Further, the retail outlet outlet is also set up by PQR without any financial support from ABC. The right available with ABC are protective of brand name, and such rights do not affect the ability of PQR to take decisions and relevant activities. hence the rights are only protective in nature not substantive in nature therefore abc does not have a power over pqr an investor holds 45% of voting rights in investing 45% is not more than 50% the remaining voting rights are held by thousands of shareholders none of them even holding more than 1% none of the shareholders had any arrangement to consult any other or make a collective decisions so the remaining 55 cannot come together and make one collective decision they are individual shareholders whether the investor of 45% has a power over the investee 100% he has a power over the investee because of the size of the holding he has he has 45% holding none of the other people even have 1% of the holding therefore it is me who hold 45% have a power over the investee i have a control over the investor on the basis of the absolute size of its holding by the investor the relative size of voting rights of other shareholders it is likely that the investor has a power over investee